Welcome back, welcome back, welcome to another edition of Gethsemane. We're so glad that you have gathered with us in this place to study God's word so that we can draw closer to him. Listen, what I want you to do, don't just be an eavesdropper, be a participant. Hit that like button, hit that share button. Let's get this message out to all four corners of the world. Also, we're so thankful for all of those who support this ministry. You don't just support it by watching you support it by also giving uh, the donations and the offerings that you give to support this ministry is so appreciated you can be able to hit that link uh, below or you can be able to hit our website or our cash app we want to thank each and every one of you that you believe in this message you believe in this ministry and what we're striving to do and because of your support it allows us to continue uh, ministering uh, to the world uh, we're going to go in, uh, into a word of prayer prayer. And then after that, uh, we'll begin our lesson on today. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for your love. We're thankful, Father, for your kindness to study your word, that it be nourishing to our bodies and our spirit. We ask to the Father that you bless us on this study on today, that it enlightens us and opens our eyes. Your name we pray. Amen. Bless it, bless it. Uh, our question on today, our question uh, on today, and, and I want to say this, I want to thank all of those who you submit your questions. We're doing our best to go to each and every question uh, and to be able to address the concerns that's in the body of Christ. Our question on today comes from at Magazine Music 3316. At ma Magazine Music uh, 3316. Uh, can you do a lesson on collections? Should a faithful Christian, uh, should a, a faithful Christian that falls on hard times, uh, that may have to go to do like a gun, a, a GoFundMe, uh, or situations of that matter? As I'm uh, looking at your question, uh, also can you expound on the verse, not grudgingly or of necessity? It seems like some preachers try to guilt you or beg you uh, for members to give. Uh, so what I what I perceive from your question is um, in pertaining to our offerings unto God, what happens when a Christian falls on hard times? And uh, we will do our best to expound on the scripture, not grudgingly or of necessity. Um, and I guess we'll deal with also the spirit of some preachers um, that try to guilt into offering. And so what we'll do on today, we'll do our best to discover, uh, to discuss our offerings and our giving unto God. And what does the Bible say? And so we're going to go through a few scriptures uh, to do our best. Thank you so much for submitting that question. Uh, we'll go through a few uh, scriptures and I'll try to cover uh, those particular areas as we discuss on today uh, our offering unto God first scripture uh, that I want to take you to is Proverbs chapter 3 Proverbs chapter 3 and I want to look at verse 9 Proverbs chapter 3 and I want to be uh, beginning verse 9 now I believe that there are a lot especially in the world there's a lot of mi misconceptions about uh, our offering unto God. If you are a baptized believer, you know that the scripture requires in, in one of our acts of service, we have several acts of service. There's praying, uh, there's communion, there's several acts of worship unto God. But one of the acts that God has instituted, uh, not in the, even in the Old Testament, but even in Christianity, in our worship to God, is the act of offering and giving. Right. And so uh, I want to I want to deal with it. Uh, but I want us, if you can, within this hour, I want you to remove your feelings, your thoughts about offering. And just let us look at a, a few of these verses so that maybe we can rebuild and come to a better understanding of what it means to give to God and what it means to give. Proverbs chapter three and verse nine. The Bible says, honor the Lord with thy substance okay honor the lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase right now we're reading out of proverbs what we're talking about is a biblical 
principle. Brother Williams, what is a principle? A principle is something that is true and that it is true in multiple circumstances and context, right? God is love. That's a principle. God is love. God is love in the morning. God is love in the evening. God is love when I'm broke. God is love when I have a lot. God is love when I'm hungry. God is love when I'm full. The principle that God is love is true no matter what circumstance you put it in. Honoring the Lord with what you have is a principle and it does not matter if you're young, old, black, white, uh, male, female, no matter what your circumstance or situation is, if you have, you're supposed to honor the Lord. Now, this should answer some uh, a part of the first question. What if a person falls on hard times and does not have? The Bible teaches that if you have an increase, you honor the Lord with your increase. But I didn't get paid this month. Then there's no requirement to give to God because you don't have God. God is so wonderful and so loving. There are some people who have this misconception that they got to God does not require for you to steal to give. So if you have no increase and if you don't have then there's nothing to give unto God. The scripture is pertaining to if there is an increase. So if God, does, so, so if, if the Lord has blessed me with increase, uh, <laughs> my mama used to teach me like this. She said, hey, listen, if somebody do something for you, you say thank you. That's what I was taught when I was growing up. When I, what I was taught when I was growing up is that if somebody does something for you. I don't care if they open up a door or uh, give you a, a cup of water, give you a blanket. I don't care if they give you a ride, no, no matter what. If somebody does something for you, you say thank you. If you're at a restaurant and somebody brings some food and after they bring the food and they serve you or whatever the case may be, you know what you do? You tip or you, you say, now you may have already paid for the food you may have already prepared to pay for the food. What is still outstanding is the is the service that you're going to receive and how the food gets to you and how you're cared for at your table. Notice there is the cost of the food and then there is the service. Our offering to God is about the service. This is why our offerings are different from person to person, from family to family. Because what God has done for me may not be the same thing that God has done. So my thank you. I want to let you know, for those of you taking notes, I want you to have this in mind. When you give your offering unto God, your offering to God is a thank you. That's what it is. You are not initiate. When you give your offering to God, you're not initiating anything. You're responding. Every time you give your offering, you are responding Brother Williams, what are you responding to? You are responding to how God has served you. Did you get your oxygen this past week? Were you able to go to work? Were you able to receive anything? Were you able to move and operate or whatever the case may be? And if God has blessed you, you, get, you say your offering is thank you, Lord. Now, whatever your thank you is, that's between you and God. If you don't feel like God has done much for you, then there's nothing for you. You may give a little bit. But if God has truly been good to you and he's blessed you, that's why the standard of giving in the New Testament is different. The standard is based upon relationship, not some set number, which is why all of our offerings are different because offering is for lovers. I want to say that again. Offering is for lovers. God loves me. God is love. God loves me and how he loves me. And because I'm in a loving relationship with him, I respond to his love, which means my offering is a love offering. I love him. And what I'm giving to him is based upon the intimate and, and personal relationship that I have with him. Nobody can tell me that what I'm giving is too much. You don't know what he's done for me. Now, now notice this. My offering is not just monetary. And I want to just say that I want to read verse nine again. Honor the Lord with your substance. 
That means with what you have. Some of you have land and houses and some of you have time. Some of you have strength. Some of you have intellect. Some of you, you have all of those things. So if the Lord has blessed you, now notice it's, it's honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of thy increase. Somebody says, well, I don't have to give any money. I'll just give the Lord my time. You still robbing God. See, you give God your time and your and all of your increase. Somebody says, well, Brother Williams, what that was referring to was like farming and stuff. Well, they didn't have currency like we have today. So if for some of you who are farmers, if you get increase, honor the Lord with your increase. There are some of you, uh, you are truly blessed in this particular. Make sure it matter of fact, the Bible is so clear. Whatever God increases you with. And if God has blessed you, take what God has given you and turn around and say thank you with that thing. If God has opened up a new world for you of business or whatever, you take that business and glorify God with it. If you're a doctor, if you're a lawyer, if you're a plumber, if you're a landscaper, if you are an auto detailer, if you're a mechanic, if uh, you are a carpenter, if you are a roofer, I don't care what your business is. You are an entrepreneur and you got your hands dabbling in multiple things. If the Lord has blessed you and increased, then you turn around with that increase and you say thank you. Now, here's the thing, uh, and, and I want to be careful not to get off on <laughs> other tangents. We Many times we have to be very careful because sometimes the thank you we show to the Lord, we'll go to a restaurant, you'll go to, uh, <laughs> you'll go to your favorite restaurant, your favorite spot, and you will show a greater appreciation for their service and what they do. Some of you will pay the entry fee into the club. Some of you will pay $100 a bottle and give $10 to the Lord. Now, there is no set amount on what you give to the Lord because it's, it's for lovers. So it's based upon how you feel about God. Your offering is based upon how you feel about God. But don't, don't think that God is blind on how you show your appreciation to other establishments and other places that you go. You will go out on a date and spend $250 on a date and you'll show up on the Lord's day and God will, sh God will see how you show your appreciation to him. What I'm saying is make sure that the love and the affection that you give to the Lord is not less than what you give to other things. Okay. Now, the Bible says in verse 10, if you do this, so shall your barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. What the Lord is saying is, listen, if you show me honor by what you have, you will never have to worry about going into lack. I will always supply you. I will always take care of you. So there are some people, they fall on hard times and it's not that they don't get increase. Sometimes you can fall on hard times and you can have increase and you say, but because I feel like I don't have enough to take care of my responsibilities, this is the week that I won't give to God. Listen, you, uh, let me give you an example. Your bills may be a hundred dollars. This is just for example, your bills may be a hundred dollars. When you get your paycheck, your paycheck may be $80. In your mind, you're thinking, I'm $20 short from my bills. Now, I want to let you know something. God didn't tell you to have Hulu and Netflix and credit card debt. And, you know, you chose that car and you got into that car note and you decided that you wanted a new person. You did this and you did that. Right. You went on that trip. Now, at the end of the month, you're short. And in the in some in people's mind, because I don't have enough to cover all of my bills, I don't give to God. Now you got paid ninety. That ninety dollars that you got that that was your increase on this week has nothing to do with your debt. So you do not give to God according to your debt. Because here's what you're doing: you get your increase, right? The first thing that you're supposed to do when you give your increase is set aside and say thank you. 
Then you look at your bills. Many of you, you get your increase, you look at your bills, and then how you determine from that, you give your thank you after you've assessed how you're going to take care of yourself. That is an incorrect way to give. I don't care if your increase is $50, $40. I don't care if it's this or that or whatever case may be. Whenever somebody gives you something, you always say thank you. And the Bible says in verse 9, it's supposed to be your first fruit. It's supposed to be your first fruit, not your second, not your third. What that means is God should be your first thought when you get paid, not your second. You don't get paid and say, oh, let me pay rent and let me pay the light bill and let me do this and let me do that. OK, whatever's left, I'm going to give over to God. If you treat God, there, there is a giving and our offering is an act of worship, which means you can give wrong. There's a right way and a wrong way to give. If God is your second thought, that that offering is not blessed. God wants to be your first fruit, not your second. God doesn't want to be the change at the bottom of your purse. God doesn't want to be the afterthought after you pay for your vacation. I want to pay for my vacation. I'm going to pay for my car. And then, Lord, I'm going to get the rest over to you. God does not want to be an afterthought. So I want to let you know something. If you're sitting in worship service and as you're sitting in worship service and, it's, and you've enjoyed the sermon and the singing and the, you, you gave all that unto the Lord. And it's time to do the next act of worship, which is to give. Giving in worship service is never supposed to be spontaneous. I want you to hear me what I'm saying. Giving and worship service is never supposed to be spontaneous. Giving and worship service is also uh, always supposed to be intentional, heartfelt, and with love in your heart. You should have been anticipating. I'm, I'm so glad that I'm able to say thank you because if you are able to give, now I say able. Now, if you're not able to give, that requirement is not on you. But if you are able to give, it means you've, you've increased. It means you have substance and then you give out of your substance and your increase. I want to say that again. If you have to give, give because it's out of love and if you received increase you give out of that somebody says brother Williams how much I don't know how much you love the Lord I don't know how much you love the Lord I don't I, I can't tell you what the bar is you treat God based upon how you feel about him somebody says well I'm gonna give that okay I guess that's how, you, how much you feel giving is also and our offering is also based on faith somebody says well if I give this to the Lord how am I gonna pay my bills you act like God can't protect, t take care of you. I want you to look at verse 10. So shall your barns be filled with plenty. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst. He said, if you give, this is a principle. If you give according to the word of God, he will supply you. If you give according to the word of God, he will supply you. If you give according to the word of God and you make sure that you give from the heart of your substance and your first fruits. Two different things from your substance and your first fruits and from that increase. He will make sure that you will have enough. If you give out of anxiety and if you give out of desperation, that offering is not blessed. Oh, Lord, please, I just help me. I'm give, but I just I need it back. That's not blessed. That, that's not blessed because you're, you're giving because you feel like you need something from the Lord when actually your offering and your giving is supposed to say thank you for what you have received. You understand what I'm saying? So if you're giving to get from God, that that giving is not a thank you. Many sometimes there's a lot of Christians you're giving and you think of it as is this your deposit so that you can get something. Lord, I'm going to give this. Lord, this is my deposit. And then I'm going to need this plus more back. No, that's not how that works. But if you give out of love and thankfulness, the Lord says, I'll make sure to take care of you and supply you. OK, so I want you to hear this from part. Your offering the first perspective of your offering is unto God. There are some people who make inaccurate statements. Uh, they say stuff like, do you know how much money I've given to the church? First of all, I'm, I'm sad for you 
because all of this time we thought you were giving to God. And this whole time you've been giving to the church. I want to let you know when you give your offering unto God, and when you give your offering, your offering is unto God. It is not unto man and is not unto the church. So when you think about what you're going to give, your mind should be focused on, Lord, this is how much you've blessed me and I'm releasing this and giving this unto you. That's your first thought. Now, this is what the world doesn't understand. The world thinks that the purpose of offering for the church is for the community. I want to let you know that's secondary. Our first perspective of offering is personal and very intimate. This is what God has done for me. And this is how much I love God. So my offering is in that lane. That's what my offering is. My offering is in that lane and it's very, very intimate because the world is not spiritual. They just think that people is just giving their offering to the building. No, 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 no. Notice uh, your offering is based on faith. So what you give, you give unto the Lord first. Now, if you only give unto the church, you're robbing God because because offering is of the spirit, it's of the mind. It's very intimate. It's not of the flesh. Offering is worship. It's worship unto God. You're giving that unto God. Now, here's the thing. Some people like to say stuff like, well, what if the church mismanage it? Then those leaders are going to have to answer. I want to let you know you never rob God because God is always going to get his at the end of the day. You don't ever have to worry. Now, don't be foolish. And if there's some things that are seen, OK, but you don't ever have to worry. Anybody who robs God is going to have to answer to God. You just make sure you don't rob God. Right. You make sure you don't rob God. So when everybody, when you give your offering, your f number one focus is unto the Lord. That's your offering. Right. Um, and that's what the world doesn't understand. The purpose of the church is, is and, and its offering is not to deal with community problems. The purpose of the church is to honor God with what we have. And so that's why we give. This is why the world hates, because the world don't worship with us and they don't understand these the scriptures that understand the word of God. What giving is, is the act of releasing. Matter of fact, every time you get an increase, some of you get paid once a week, some of you get paid twice a week, some of you get paid once a month, regardless of that, whenever, whenever you get your increase. God teaches us in Christianity, it is the act of releasing. Do you know what Christians are always practicing? We are always practicing letting go, not selfishness. You cannot be a worshiper and greedy at the same time because within the, within the ingredient of worship, one of the ingredients is offering, which means we're constantly saying thank you. God is teaching us in worship to remember where we get our increase from. Every week, every month, uh, every time that we have, we are reminded to say thank you. So it, within the ingredient of worship, he's teaching us never to hold on, but to consistently let go. Matter of fact, if you're a good giver, you're probably a good forgiver. I want you to hear what I just said. If you practicing, if you practice giving, you are you're probably good at forgiving because in order to forgive, you have to let go in order to give. You have to let go. And God teaches us that in worship. So you don't you don't think about what you're losing. You're thinking about who you're giving to. So it's, it's a shift in mentality. Next scripture I want to take you to is Mark. Uh, very quickly, I want you to go to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. And let's just look at what the Word of God says. In Mark chapter... Uh, I'm sorry. In Mark chapter 12. In Mark, in Mark chapter 12. And I want us to look at verse 41. Mark chapter 12 and verse 41. 
And Jesus set over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. So I want you to see the scene. Jesus is sitting there and Jesus is watching offering. I don't want anybody to ever tell you or try to teach you that God didn't care about offering, that Jesus didn't care about offering. Matter of fact, in Mark uh, chapter 12, and there's also an account in Luke, Jesus is sitting watching people give their offering. That's what Mark chapter 12, verse 41 is. He's watching to see who gives and Jesus knows how much they're giving, even though he's a ways off, but he's watching. The Bible says, verse 41, Jesus set over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. Jesus is studying and watching how people give. Well, why would Jesus do that? Because it's important. It's important. The Bible says, and many that were rich cast in, in much. So Jesus noticed that those who had a lot of money would put a lot of money into the treasury. The Bible says in verse 42, and there came a certain poor widow and she threw in two mites. All she had was two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples. He thought this was a teaching moment. Jesus says, okay, okay, everybody come here. Everybody come really, really close because they're watching the offering. And Jesus waited. He didn't make mention of those who were rich. He saw the poor widow. Notice her condition. She's poor. She's a widow. And she has, she has very little money. She takes the two mics. She pours it in. Jesus calls his disciples over and he makes a teaching point off of her and says, hey, look at that. Look at that widow. Everybody pay attention. Look at that widow. The Bible says. Verse 43. Verily, verily, verily I say unto you that this poor widow have cast in more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they that did cast in their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all she had, even all her living. Jesus is teaching about offering. And what he tells his disciples is out of everybody who gave today, the poor widow who put all that she had in gave more than everybody else. So that lets us know even how Jesus looks at offering. It's not how much you give. It's not how much you give because there were rich people who gave more than the woman with two mites. Is that the woman with two mites gave off of her faith. She took everything that she had and she gave it unto the Lord. In order to do that, you have to give by faith. Sometimes when we say, I don't have any money. That, that may not be true. You may have five dollars. You may have <laughs> you may have twenty dollars to your name and it may feel like nothing. I can't tell you what to give. What Jesus is teaching is this woman right here. She's the one that really gave today. Which lets me know that God honors those who give sacrificially. And she gave also on faith. I do not read that she gave out of distress. She did not try to uh, strike a deal with God. God, if I give this, will you give this to me? She gave on faith. In order to give at this level, you have to believe in God and that he's gonna take care of you. Some of you struggle in your giving because you don't really believe that God will come through for you. You think that what you have, you might as well just hold on to it and use it for yourself. This is why I believe that giving is an act of worship because it teaches faith. You can't give and not. Now, if you have a lot, you probably just give off the top. Okay, I got a lot of money. I'll just give off the top. So giving a hundred dollars, giving four hundred, five hundred dollars for you is nothing because you may make, you know, seven, eight thousand dollars a month. So giving three, four hundred dollars, you may spend that on shoes. You you spend that on on dinner. It's nothing for you. But the person who really gives sacrificially, man, to give a hundred dollars, they are really trusting in God. Now, I want to say this before I move on. God does not expect you to give and not be a good steward over what he gave you. So I knew somebody who uh, 
had like eight credit cards and was saying that they needed help, <laughs> you know, and and when uh, it was looked into, they realized that they were frivolously wasting their money on subscriptions and all that kind of stuff. Uh, some people are in difficult situations because you're not a good steward of the Lord's money. You don't invest. Uh, you don't work. Some people are lazy. Now, I want to say there's a lot of other factors that we're not discussing, but I'm talking about those who maybe you are a good steward and maybe you find yourself in a difficult situation. I, I, we already read earlier, if there is no increase and you have no abundance or you have no substance, God is not requiring for you to give. There's nothing to give. Right. But if the Lord has blessed you with increase and you have substance, you give from that. And you give off of faith. God is teaching and, and let, uh, he let his disciples know for all they did cast in from their abundance. So what the Lord is teaching is for those who are rich, they gave off the top. But the woman who who gave more than them all she gave from the heart she gave from the core of of her substance so we want to make sure that we give um from that place so the first scripture uh another uh, next scripture i want to take you to is first corinthians and many of you you read this scripture every lord's day you read this scripture every lord's day we're in first corinthians chapter 16 and I want to give the second perspective of giving. Now, now I already mentioned the first perspective of giving is unto the Lord. There is a second perspective of giving, but it must be done in order. My first is unto God and I'm focused on what he has done for me and I give unto God. The second perspective of giving is what you find in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 1, now concerning the collection for the saints. Now, I have an offering that goes unto God, but then the Bible also lets me know that I can also give unto the church to serve the body of Christ. Brother Williams, what does that mean? Let me read this. Now concerning the collection for the saints, if I've given to the uh, order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So what the Bible is letting us know in this offering, that this offering is based upon how, how God has prospered you. Well, that's different from one family to the next. But this offering was going to be collected because there were some saints that were in need. So if somebody says, well, Brother Williams, I've fallen on, on very difficult times. If the church gives, then the church should be able to bless his own. One of the things that I struggle with is there are some people who say, well, Brother Williams, this person's in need and that person's in need and this person's in need. But you got to understand our ability to help people is based upon your offering. If you're at your local congregation and you don't give, then it limits the church on the impact that they can make with the church. There may be somebody at your congregation right now. They're being evicted. Somebody has uh, is going through a repossession. There's somebody right now at your congregation, their lights are off, their water is off. Certain things are happening. And so if they go to the church, so let me tell you what happens. For those of you who may not understand and may not know, there are some people who go to the church and they say, here are my bills and here's what's going on. Can I have help? Let me tell you what the church does. The church says, okay, submit that in. They'll look at the bills. They'll look at what happened and they'll look at the offering. If, a, if you're at a good church and you got good stewards at your church, let me tell you what they'll do. They'll look at the bills and then they'll look at the offering, Right. And then and then from that, that determines what they can do. If your church has ever denied you, if your church says, listen, we won't be able to help you. If your church ever says um, <laughs> that's not something we can do. Sometimes you will have people get angry, be like, well, why wasn't the church able to? But you didn't. Well, you know what question you're not asking? How much was offering last week? How much did the church give overall? What are the bills of the church? If, if it's been communicated to you with the bills of the church, 
and you put $20 in, some people may put $20 in and they may find out that there's a need. Well, you got, you may have, uh, you may have four, five, six hundred dollars $600 of excess change in, in your possession. And maybe just on this past Sunday, you gave $20. But you're walking around with four, five hundred dollars in your pocket, and then you come to a church member that may have a, a, a situation where they need an extra two hundred fifty dollars, but it didn't match it, it. It didn't match the offering of the church. So now the church has to make difficult decisions. Here's another thing that you're not realized: you don't know how many requests your church receives. Also, what you're not aware of, you're not aware of, of how many people try to pimp the church. You're not aware of how many people who they have a, uh, they have a carousel of about four or five churches in the city that they go to every other month and ask for money and funds. And, and there are some people, they literally have a system. They go to this church in January, March, July, and September. They go to this church, and they're going to go to that church in February. They're going to go to that church in April and November, right? They got a slew of about four or five churches that they know is generous and will help. And all they have to do is just work the system. Some churches are fully aware of that. So sometimes a church will say no because they have come in contact with that particular person or family before and they know it's just a scheme. You have to have enough faith and trust in your congregation to know how to move in those situations. Another perspective is if the church is not giving enough, the church has to have some hard decisions to make to say, well, we can help. But every church should have a budget. So when that church reaches that budget, they say, well, past this financial point, we're not able to help. And then sometimes the church wants to do some other things and, hey, why don't we get a bus and why don't we do this and why don't we fix this and why don't we build another wing? And so the church gets into an obligation to try to do certain things to serve and the offering didn't increase, but the bills did. And so there are some people, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of other factors. Some people get all emotional about, you know, why are we spend all this money on the building? Because that's a that's a good place for the people to come to get served. Where is counseling going to take place? You want the preachers to you want the preacher to meet people in his own house? Oh, you like when preachers make house visits. Some of y'all won't even open the door. Some of you don't want the preacher in your house. Somebody said, I just I I like it when you know churches don't need to be building big buildings. They just need to you know worship under the tree. That's really close to God. Some of you won't come under the tree. And some people don't need to be, uh, you know, we over there trying to do baptisms at the lake <laughs> and whatnot. I don't think it's a bad deal. And I want to let you know this. I have an experience. I've been, I, uh, North Colony started in the house. So I've been in, I've been in a house. I've been in a storefront. <laughs> we've been in a community center. Pretty much any place that you can. We've been in a hotel. Any place that you could probably think of, North Colony has probably traveled that journey. And people who try to glamorize house churches or people who try to glamorize, why don't we just go, you know, uh, they don't, you, people who pro try to glamorize, you probably don't have any experience in doing it, <laughs> right? When it's time to have Bible study and you got to try to find a place where to have Bible study or uh, that it would be appropriate, uh, you try not to infringe on people's houses and people living in all different type of situations. Sometimes the, the, the marriage ain't strong and you're over there having Bible studies at the house and you can see tension. There's a bunch of other stuff that goes on, in, you know, people's house. Sometimes families fall, or fall on hard times. You got to move it from one house to the next. Uh, sometimes the space is not adequate or whatever. the case. You got all those different scenarios. So sometimes when a church invests in a property and say, this is our place and we want everybody to come and it's a place where everybody can feel comfortable. I don't feel, I don't think anything is wrong with that. Cause if you've been in the other situations that I've been in, you don't understand all the things that you have to consider. Right. First Corinthians chapter 16, verse one and two says, listen, there are church members that are in need. And so what they were doing in first Corinthians 16 is that they were gathering the, the collection from multiple churches to help the, 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 the church and the saints in need. I am a firm believer that the church should take care of their own if you're able to. I also think it's OK 
to minister and serve those uh, of the world. So you have those who may not be a member of your congregation. I think you should show love to everybody. I think you should give first preference to those that are under your ministry, though. So it makes no sense to give food to those who are in the neighborhood and you let the members of your own congregation starve. That makes no sense to me. If somebody is at our congregation and they don't have groceries, we need to do what we can to go take care of those who need groceries. Just also know that comes from offering. What's the first perspective of offering? First perspective of offering is between you and God, which means if you give unto God, how God blesses you is dependent on your faith and your love unto him. So your increase is not church-wide when you give. Your increase is very personal. You can sit next, right next to me in worship service and I give and you give. But the blessing on my giving is going to be very, very personal. If you didn't give from faith and I gave from faith, you might not get blessed this week, but I may receive an increase and my barns may be filled. My cup may be overflowing. You may have even physically gave more than me, but I gave from the heart and I gave from faith. Does that make sense? The second perspective of offering is for the needs and the cares of the saints and the church. And when I say the church, I'm talking about people. How we care for, for the church, right? Is somebody in need? Does somebody need clothes? You need shoes? The children, the, 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 the children don't have a, a, a bed to sleep in? Y'all need pillows? Baby don't have no underwear. Your children need diapers? You need milk? That's what the church should be tending to. Caring for the needs of, for those who can't. And that needs to be identified. And sometimes you have to do some good research to, to determine who's manipulating because the devil's in the, in the midst. So some people are manipulating. You have to identify the manipulators and cast a light on them and rebuke that. But for those who are legitimately in need, you take care of those. You take care of the saints. Some people lead a church and they go down to the, to the, to the, to the bread line of another faith or another uh, uh, teaching and they're not in that line because they believe in what that church uh, teaches. They're in that line because they're hungry, right? And sometimes the devil shows up in the kitchen of the church and you won't give food and you won't give bread to those that are in need. So that's what 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2 is talking about. Our last scripture that I want us to look at is 2 Corinthians chapter 9. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and I want us to look at verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and verse 5. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they will go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty. Whereof ye had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as covetousness. So what Paul says is, I'm going to send some people ahead of time to you to get you ready to make sure that the offering will be collected and ready to go when I get there. Why? Because the ministry has to be taken care of. People have needs, people are suffering, and, and it's going to take funds uh, to be able to do it. So here's what the Apostle Paul would do. The Apostle Paul would send individuals into the city to make sure that, every, this is Bible, to make sure that, that the funds were collected. Because many times on the first day of the week, they would collect all of those funds and then distribute it. If you have an opportunity, I want you to look at Acts chapter 6. They, in, in Jerusalem, they had a food distribution program. As a matter of fact, it's one of the first ministries of the Church of Christ. In Acts chapter 6, people who were hungry, they had a food distribution program that needed to be funded and they would take care of each other. If you also have the opportunity to read Acts chapter 2, how people left homes and people left their possessions and the church took care of them. All of, all of these things, the, the church took on. Now, Remember, the first priority of, of the church is not to take care of the needs of the community of the people. The first priority of the church is that when you give, you give unto God. That should be your number one focus. If you say, I, give, I gave my money to the church. When, when did you give your money to the Lord? 
Do you know how much money I gave to the church? Then then your offering was never blessed because you're over there counting God's money. It was never your money. It was the Lord's money. If somebody has mishandled the Lord's money, they have to answer to God. And I'm not saying don't hold people accountable, but stop counting God's money. And stop acting like you gave a lot to God. You've given nothing to God. Matter of fact, what you've given to God is your, res is, is your response to how much he's given to you. So check your speech. Your first priority is to give to God. Your second priority is to minister to the saints and to take care of the household of God. The third priority of church offering is to those on the outside. One to God, one to the church and the household of faith. And number three, after that, because remember what I said, you don't give to the community and take care of the community and you don't even consider God. You, you don't take care of the people of the community and neglect the household of faith and the saints that are in the house. We take care of our own. The Church of Christ should take care of their own. All right. And, and, and many times when we have people who don't give, we have a lot of churches right now. They're struggling. And we say, well, why don't we do greater ministry? Because it, it, it requires a greater level of offering. It requires a greater level of offering. Think everything cost. And the church don't get a discount because they're a church. Matter of fact, sometimes they'll charge a church more. You want to keep the lights on? You want the water? You, do you know how much the water bill is? Do you know how much the light bill is? Do you know how much the insurance is to make sure that if anybody gets hurt or you know everybody's covered, the church will be covered? Do you know you have to take care of the man of God? Do you know you have to take care of those uh, who the secretary or those of the staff of the church? Do you know uh, how much it costs to get supplies and carts and to have materials and audio and all, all of these things cost and they have monthly cost. And if you want to do something on a greater, the bigger the vision, the bigger the offering has to be. Some churches have great vision. They don't have people who to support the, the, the ministry. There are some people, they may enjoy this broadcast, but they don't give to it. We don't make people feel guilty. So I think it was one of the questions about preachers that are begging. I don't, me personally, I don't believe in begging because if you don't want to do it, then, but, but don't complain about the church not doing or don't complain about people. Why don't you do this? People are really good at coming up with ideas. Well, I think we will put your name down on the contract. Be a co-signer. You, you sign up to somebody. So well, I don't want that responsibility. Somebody else needs to then hold your idea. It's not, it's not a really good idea. The church is not short on ideas. The, 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 the church is short on the ability to do it. And the ability to do ministry comes from people. God blesses the people and the people do the ministry. So if the ministry is not able to get off the ground, you have to look at the people because there's nothing wrong with God. God will supply. So there's nothing wrong with God. So if God is a great supplier, you can't accuse God for, for being a, 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 a bad supplier. So if God is a great supplier, then you have to look at the people. Why are the people not giving? So in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 5, therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before you and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof you had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as covetousness. Let's look at verse 6. Let's look at verse 6. But this I say, he was so sparingly, shall reap also sparingly. He was so bountifully, shall reap also bountifully. What the Lord is letting us know is that what you give, if you give a little bit, you're going to get a little bit. If you give a lot, you'll give a lot. The Bible already lets us know the spirit in which we should give. The Bible says in verse 7, every man, according as he has purposed in his heart, so let him give. Then the Bible says, not grudgingly or of necessity. I don't give because I need something from God. I give because I love him. I don't give grudgingly, which means no preacher should get in the pulpit and try to force people to give. No preacher should try to guilt people into giving because if they give out of guilt, God doesn't want that type of offering. 
right? So your offering should not be by guilt. It should not be forced. You should not be manipulated to give. Matter of fact, I shouldn't try to give you a sad story so that you can give more. You should be able to see what God has done for you. The job of the preacher is to show you the goodness of God so that you give from that place. You don't give out of fear and you don't you don't give uh, because you feel like something bad is going to happen to you. You give out of a loving place. The Bible says every man as he has purpose in his heart, so let him give. And God says not grudgingly nor of necessity. I don't give because I need. I give because I love. When you give, you should be motivated and it should be based off of love. It should not be based out of guilt. And then he says this in verse seven, for God loves a what kind of giver? Something that we repeat every Sunday. God loves a cheerful giver. There is an emotional response that you're supposed to have when you give and it should be with joy. Why, Brother William, should we give out of joy? Because your mind and your heart is focused on what God has done for you. It should not be focused on people. Your first and primary thought when you give from your substance and your first fruit is unto God. Secondly, it is for the care and the needs of the church. So sometimes the church will do another offering or they will have a special offering because people are in need. Situations happen, life circumstances. Sometimes a church is going through um, a crisis or there was a tornado or there have been damage and they're trying to rebuild and help people rebuild their life. You may give a special offering unto that. There's nothing wrong with that. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 16 is that type of giving, right? So uh, the, the best way I can describe to you that, that our offering is twofold. It is our love and our devotion unto God, and it is the care for the saints. And then thirdly, it is a ministering to the community. You will have some people believe that the primary purpose of the church is to improve the community. That is not true. The primary focus of the church is not to improve the community. The primary focus of the church is to honor God. I'm going to take you back to our very first scripture. Our, our primary focus in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 9 is to honor God. The world don't care about our worship service. So they say that they don't mind us worshiping, but they say, well, what are you doing for the community? I want to let you know that is a that is a third item on the list. Well, what's the first primary? Our first primary is unto God. What's your second primary is unto each other. What's the third primary? Those outside of the faith. That's how the, the funds of the church should should flow unto God, unto the church, into the saints and then to the community. Well, I want to see what your church does in the community. Well, we can, we are supposed to do things. They will know us by our love. It is supposed to flow into the community, especially if we give right. It's supposed to flow over into the community. But we take care of the household business first. We minister unto us. And let me say this outside of offering. The primary focus of our worship service is to God, not to appease the world. We're not here uh, as a uh, community uh, program, you know, to help the community with reading and clothes. All of those are great ministries and programs. The primary focus of the church, the primary focus of the church is honoring God. That is in our offering. That is in our communion. That is in our um <laughs> and I worship unto God. Everything that we do, our primary focus is, have we honored and glorified God in this? The second is to show love unto each other. We talk about the greatest commandment in the, in, the, in the Bible. The greatest commandment is to love God. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Well, what's the second greatest commandment? The second greatest commandment is to love each other. Right? Am, am I quoting scripture? What's the, what is the greatest commandment? Love You loving God with everything that is in you. Well, what's the second greatest commandment? We're supposed to love each other. And I'm talking about the household of faith. The way we talk about each other, the way we talk about the church of Christ, the way we talk about that, we are not fulfilling the second greatest commandment in the Bible. The second greatest commandment in the Bible is how we love on one another, how we take care of one another. That's what 1 Corinthians 16, he said, let there be no gatherings when I come. This is the offering and the collection for the saints. We got to take care of the church. 
And then the third is how we show love to those on the outside. <laughs> right? The Bible says in verse, uh, the end of verse seven, God loves a cheerful giver. You should be excited to give unto God. If you don't have that joy and you give in grudgingly, that offering is not blessed. You should have some joy when you give to God. You should be thankful that God has blessed you enough to have increase and abundance. The Bible says in verse eight, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always having all sufficiency and all things may abound to every good work. God supplies you so that the work can go on. God blesses you so that you can support the work. Don't sit there and enjoy a ministry. That's that's like you going to a, a restaurant and you enjoying the food, but you don't support the restaurant by paying for it. Right. If 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 you see a ministry that's effective and that's doing God's business, don't just sit there and enjoy the fruits of the labor. Support it. We don't have enough saints supporting and some of the stuff that we are supporting is not worth supporting. Support, su support a move of God, support the work of the church. Right. You know, your church need new chairs. <laughs> you know, your church uh, uh, <laughs> needs a, a new refrigerator or, uh, the, 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 you know, half the ceiling is falling apart. Don't just talk about the church. You know what most people do? They be like, ah, oh, this this church needs some some work. Let me go to another church where the <laughs> where it's already got everything together. We got saints that won't stay at a congregation that maybe God has led you to actually do the work and, and, and bless that church. You would rather go to a church, sit in the back where you don't really have to do anything. Support a work that's really trying to do it. Support, support, support a minister that's really trying to preach God's word. Support uh, your, your your the youth ministry. Support you know they need snacks or they need new Bibles or they need. There's a lot of work to be done, and it's not always with your money. Some of you have connections and resources. Some of you are able to connect and be able to do certain things. It, it, it it's it's your offering unto God is you giving your the Bible says you give your body as a sacrifice. Your whole life is supposed to be an offering unto the Lord. Lord, I want you to use my mind. Lord, I want you to use my intelligence. Lord, I want you to use my ideas, use my hands and my feet. Lord, use my heart. You use my eyes, my my mouth. Lord, I just want to I just pray that you are glorified by everything that I try to do in your kingdom. Your life should be an offering. And the Bible says if you do that, verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound towards you. That you will always have sufficiency in all things and may abound to every good work. If you're a good, if you're a good giver, God will supply you to do the ministry that he has placed on your heart to do. There's a reason why you're at that congregation and there's a reason why God has brought you to that particular ministry. Not just to watch it, but support it and give your efforts to it. As it is written, he have dispersed abroad and he have given to the poor. His righteousness remain forever. I'm close here in verse 10. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. God will bless the farmer and the farmer will bless the community. That's how it works. God blesses the farmer and the farmer blesses the If God has blessed you, and God has given you resources. God is, is calling you to bless somebody. God is calling you. You might be the farmer in this text. Don't just sit on it. Find ways to be a blessing unto others and to be able to give. It's time for us to get this gospel out. It's time for us. It's, it's time for the church to be on the move. And God needs your time. God needs your intellect. God needs your skills. God needs you. We don't have enough people invested in the work of God for it to be what we all desire for it to be. Making an impact on the world at the level where it turns the world upside down. I'm committed to it. Are you committed to it? Hey, let's do this together.
I want to thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for the question. Hopefully, I answer some of those questions and giving you the right mindset and, and spirit. Now, here's the thing. There are those who say, hey, listen, I don't have enough to give. Um, keep walking and living faithfully. Because when you know how that feels, the day that God supplies you again, don't forget about those that are in need. Don't forget about those that need to be ministered to. Right. And if God has blessed you to have substance and increase, honor God and then bless the church and then give to the community. I know people that are in the church. They don't give to the church. They don't give any of their substance. To the, they give to the Red Cross. They give to the Salvation Army. Did you know that the Salvation Army is a church? So you as a church of another faith, they have worship service every Sunday, which means you say, well, I like the work that they're doing. I don't, I don't feel like I have to give my offering to the local church. Well, then why go? You go to the bathroom, you, you, you use the lights, you hear a sermon, you take the communion, you you see that the building and the church has to operate in a, in a certain type of way. And some that some people say, well, I want to I want to see a, a greater impact of what I've given unto then then do more. But don't rob. Don't rob from your from don't rob from the ministry that blesses you. If you got sick, the church would come visit you. If, if somebody died, the church would open up the doors and service those who are grieving. Somebody wants to get married. Somebody they open up the church for somebody to use the facility. We got a lot of great we got a lot of work to do in the kingdom. And we need enough people who understand the word of God and are committed to fulfilling that work to go to the next level. Like I said, I pray that this blesses you. I pray that this open up your mind or even cause you to think. What is your offering unto God? What is your commitment to God? What is your what is your commitment to play your part in changing the world through the gospel? I want you to hit that like button. I want you to hit that share button. Let's get this message out. Let's let everyone hear what thus saith the Lord. I pray that this has poured into your cup and it is beginning to overflow. Thank you for tuning in week in and week out. Listen, your support, uh, your prayers, uh, the comments, the questions that, that you that you send. We thank you so much for them. Uh, also, at the same time, if this ministry has been a blessing to you, don't just watch. Be a supporter of this ministry. We can even go to a greater level if for everyone who watches, if you would give and if you would support, we could actually do even some greater things and widen this broadcast even to a greater audience. Hey, listen, we have to partner together and we partner together with God. For those of you who are praying, for those of you who believe, I believe that these things can take place. Hey, listen, I want to let you know something. We are here to heal, help and restore. Be blessed.